I know I started my day this morning at 8 o'clock this morning with some of you in my Methods of Bible Study class, and I'm ending it with all of you tonight, so it's good to be here. Many of you don't know me. I teach in the undergrad Christian Ministries Department, training future leaders of ministries, of, so you all should join our major. But uh, aside from that plug, one of the things that keeps me sane and, and really kind of refreshed in life is the fact that I get to be the chaplain for the Orange County Fire Authority. And I don't know if any of you guys, and maybe ladies, actually had a boyhood dream of riding on fire engines, but I get to live out that dream on a regular basis. And I actually am assigned to a battalion uh, down in the Dana Point area where I live, and I get to, I have my own uniform, my own turnouts, I get to ride on a fire engine any day of the week that I want. It doesn't get any better than that. You could golf all you want, it's still not as fun as riding on a fire engine. And the reality is it kind of gets pressed home to me all the time when I actually get to go on the calls with the guys. And so when I ride out, I actually have a seat on the truck or the engine, whatever I'm riding out on. And, and whatever they do, I get to do. And a few years ago, actually now, we went on a call early in the morning in Dana Point for a woman that's having chest pain. And so in, in Orange County, the paramedics are on fire engines. And so we responded code three to her house and we are walking in her door and all of a sudden this giant bird just swooped in over our heads and flew upstairs. We had no idea what just happened, so we kind of went to the lady and started taking care of, of her, and as we're getting her, you know, kind of kind of looked at and assessed, we realized she needed to go to the hospital right away, and so we're getting her loaded up on the ambulance gurney, and I happened to be riding out, and so I just was another pair of hands, and so the captain that night, or that morning, actually just looked at myself and the other firefighter and said, all right, guys, you have to get whatever bird that was out of her house. And we went and we looked, and in the living room, whatever had flown in had brought in a headless dove that was going to be its lunch. And so we knew that this was a rather large bird that had flown upstairs. And so we um, realized that this was going to be a little bit of a task. And so I remember looking at the other firefighter and saying, hold on a minute. And I went out back out to the engine and put on my turnouts, got my helmet, got my gloves, got my goggles. And I always said, okay, now we're ready. You know, because this, if this is going to tear off the head of a dove, I don't know what it's going to do to me. So we go upstairs. And sure enough, in the office of this woman's house, perched on top of a computer monitor, was a giant hawk that had flown into this, this woman's house unannounced, uninvited, and now it was up to us to get it out. And so we're thinking to ourselves, how are we gonna get this giant hawk out of our room? And so we thought if we can just open up the window, push out the screen, maybe we could scare it to fly out the window screen. And so we shut the door, and sure enough, that's what we did. We, we reached over, we pushed out the screen, and then we started making noises and waving our hands to, to scare it. And sure enough, we scared it. And it started flying all around the room, flying into walls, flying all around, but not out the window. And so it falls actually behind the computer desk, tangled in the wires. And, and the other firefighter looked at me and said, you're closest. <laughs> and so his intention was that I was going to with my gloved hands and full turnouts on, go and reach down and grab this giant hawk. And so as I got down low, I saw in this giant bird's eyes, this beautiful yellow eye, just looking at me, pleading now, saying, please, sir, help me, will you? And, and, and sure enough, I reached down and I put my arms around this hawk and I go to throw it out the window. When the other firefighter says, wait! And I look at him like, what? He goes, it might be injured, because this is like the second story, you know, and he's afraid that this hawk is going to be hurt by falling out of the second story. And so we, we gently carry it all the way downstairs. I put it on the grass, and sure enough, it flies away, and uh, I am a hawk rescuer. Thank you very much. So <laughs> I, I share that brief story, not just to give you a glimpse into my craziness of what I like to do in my spare time, but... I honestly think many of you, as I work with students th you know, throughout the week and meet with students and love hanging out with you guys, I know about this time of the semester, you are completely overwhelmed with assignments. And you stay up late at night cursing at your professors, thinking that we, way back when we began the semester, thought, how can I torment these students by assigning all these assignments at the very last minute? And then you think we actually are in cahoots with each other, that we actually talk to one another and say, let's all have an assignment due on the same day. And so as you're you know, just overwhelmed with this amount of work, not realizing that you probably procrastinated a little bit too long, hence why you're all here tonight at the end of the semester trying to get <laughs> chapel credit in, but realizing that you're just completely overwhelmed and in your good hearts, you're just not sure what to do. 
Not only because you have all this that's expected from your professor, but there's a reality that you have a lot expected of you, period. You have parents that probably call you more often than they really should from home asking how you're doing. And they're always asking things like, are you eating enough? Are you dating enough? Are you hanging out enough? Are you getting good grades? They're always worried about grades, right? Parents always wanna know, what did you get on that test? And all of a sudden, it's like these innocent conversation that we as parents wanna have with our children turn into adding mounds of pressure that you already have put on yourselves. Because let's be honest with you, many of you in here are overachievers. Right? I mean, for many of you, you bought into the lie way back in kindergarten that an A was the only acceptable grade you were allowed to have. And so B's and C's are just atrocious in your mind. And so you put this pressure on yourself that if you can't get that A in that class from that professor who's so mean that they put all these assignments on at the last minute, then really your worth as an individual should be questioned. So you have parents' pressure, professors' pressure, friend pressure, and then you have this, your own pressure building up with inside of you, and then you come to a place like Biola, and we talk about what does God expect of us? And that sometimes becomes the spiritual trump card that we just can't live up to. What does God want with me? And you feel like, you know what, I'm doing everything I can to hold it together. How can I think about that? But tonight I want you to know one thing. The one thing I want you to leave here knowing is that you belong to the king. Plain and simple. That's all he expects. That you will be his son, you will be his daughter, adopted through Christ. We're gonna be looking at a passage tonight in the book of Romans. I'm not sure if you brought your Bible, but in Romans chapter eight, we see this incredible discussion about what it means to live a life through the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting about this section of Romans that Paul is kind of coming out of a discussion that we've been saved, no matter what kind of sin issues we have, for we all have fallen short of the glory of God. We have been saved by the grace of Jesus that he showed us on the cross. And yet Paul in the book of Romans, he's, as he's working through this discussion of living out our faith, he comes to Romans chapter seven and you have this really cool interplay with Paul and himself saying, I don't know what I do or why I do it. And he's struggling, but how do I live out this life that God expects me to live? And he comes to this conclusion in Romans chapter eight that it's only by the Holy Spirit, only by the life that the Spirit regenerates within us that we really can make it, that we really have the strength to do what we're called to do. And he gives this conclusion, and I'm just gonna briefly look at it tonight in verse 15 and 16. When in Romans chapter eight he says, verse 15 and 16, he says, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. You know, that's really what expectations are unproper, unholy expectations that you, yourself, other people, your parents put upon you, they really make you a slave to fear because you fear what will happen to me if I don't do this? If I don't get into that program, if I don't make the team, if I don't get the right you know, you know, grade on a, on a report card at the end of the year, all these what ifs, they build up and all of a sudden we start living according to someone else's expectations, and we become the slave again and again to fear. And some of you are here tonight, and that's exactly how you feel. You're overwhelmed. But here's the reality. Paul says, but, that's not you, but you receive the spirit of sonship. And by him, the spirit, by him, we cry, Abba, Father. What's interesting in the Greek, that word sonship that many of our NIV Bibles use actually is the word adoption. It's the word weothie. I mispronounced that a little bit for you Greek Bible majors, but um, the reality is this. We, the Bible truly says, have received the spirit of adoption. Verse 16 continues by saying this. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's Children, in other words, vouching for us, standing up beside us, verifying this truth about our lives, that we have this new identity, living out as an adopted child, an intimate, joyful relationship with God, so much that we don't have to give in to that fear, to those expectations, to that bondage, but instead we could truly cry out, Daddy, which is what that word Abba Father really is translated as. Now this word, adoption, the idea of sonship, which for many of us, we know that verse, we, under, we, we think about that truth, 
But here's the reality. For those of us who were raised in a family with parents, whether you liked them or not, if you had parents, you have no idea what it's like to not belong to a family. You truly don't understand the plight of an orphan. You know, I honestly did not know that either. In 2004, there was a lot of buzz going on in the church world about what was taking place in South Africa. And the church was actually getting a black eye because for the most part, we had kind of considered what was taking place with the AIDS epidemic as more of a result of sinful behavior. And so the church, to its own fault, was not doing anything about the AIDS crisis in South Africa. And as people started to talk about this situation, some other people in my church, and I started to pray, God, what would be our response? What should we as a, as a local church do about the situation in South Africa? And so in 2005, I led a small team from our church to, to go to Johannesburg, South Africa, to just kind of partake with a group of people who are caring for orphan children. And we, we spent a week and a half there, and we, were, we loved on the kids, and we kind of got a new home, kind of raised up for them, and, and we left. And I remember being on that plane coming home, and people were talking about, Dave, which one do you want to adopt? And I'm like, none. I got two hands. I already have two beautiful children. I'm tapped out. I don't have any more room. And yet, you know, I come home, and I start talking about the children in South Africa that I had met, and that we needed to kind of raise the funds to kind of continue their care and their, their education, and I took more teens back to South Africa. And God started to work on my heart and my family's heart about, there's more that we needed to do. And I gave the excuse to God, well, God, there wasn't anything more I could do, because legally at that time, Americans were not allowed to adopt children from South Africa. There was no a treaty between the two countries. And so, God, I'm sorry, but I just am not the guy who could, you know, step in here and adopt a child. Well, God started working through my own children, my, my son Adam, my daughter Amy, who actually is a freshman here now. They started to talk about what we needed to do as a family. And as we visited South Africa as a family, they fell in love with another brother and sister. And they came to Debbie, my wife and I, and started saying, Dad, we need to adopt. And I'm like, we don't have the money. We can't adopt. America's not allowed. And yet, God started saying, no, now's the time to get involved. And I started realizing through being there enough that the only long-term solution for the orphan crisis in the world is adoption. You can't fund enough orphanages. You don't have enough money to make that a reality. And so, really, the only solution for long-term viability is adoption. And so we as a family began the journey of saying, okay, God, what are you doing here in our family? What are you doing in our lives? And we started looking at what would it mean for us to adopt? And as luck seemed to have it, God provided the money, God opened the door. So in 2009, our family was the first American family to legally adopt a child from South Africa. When we first met Fundo that first day, he was not responsive to us. He just kind of laid on the couch, and we had to kind of get down in his face, and he kind of reached out and grabbed onto my finger. And that's, that's you and I. When we first have this inkling that God wants us, we don't know how to respond to the Almighty God who, who, who died in our place. We kind of reach out, but we're unsure how. You saw pictures of, of kind of Funo's journey with us and how he started to play with them and, and how he started to kind of come out of his shell. And one of the things that reason we understood that while Fundo was to be adopted was because he wasn't thriving in the orphanage. He was developmentally behind because of the trauma that he had gone through at such a young age. And yet that's you, that you have been wounded, that you have been broken, and that you don't even know how to express yourself to God. And it really takes God to come to you. You saw pictures of me wearing the one and only suit that I had at that time as we stood before a South African judge to officially adopt Fundo on our third day in country. And what you have to understand about adoption is it's the choosing. So I didn't understand this really until I became an adoptive dad. You know, when my wife and I had our naturally born children, we were just grateful that they were healthy, right? I mean, you just kind of accept when other comes out the, the chute, right? You're not putting it back, you're not, you're not trading it in. You're just like, oh, yay, thank you, God, it's healthy, it has all the fingers and toes we really want it to have. So, you know, with, with, the, with the natural born children, you're just grateful, but with adoption. I remember we got a phone call in October that said that we had been matched and they were gonna send us a picture and we had the choice do we want to adopt Fundo or not? 
I will always look at Fundo and be able to say, I chose you. I didn't have to, but I chose you. And when we read this passage in Romans chapter eight, verse 15, it says, but you have received the spirit of adoption. What God is really saying to you is, I chose you. You didn't choose me. This wasn't something that you signed up for. This is something that I reached out across the heavens and I said, I want you. And Romans chapter eight goes on, and, and sorry, um, five, eight talks about that, what God did to demonstrate his love for us in this. And so when we look at Fundo now and how he's just kind of blossomed, I don't know if we can show this picture. This is a, a picture about a year old. It'll come on the screen eventually maybe. Um, but this is Fundo now and Fundo has regained his childhood. He is blossoming as a kindergarten, and when I called him right before I came here to, to say goodnight to him, he said, I read three books today, Dad. You know, here's a child that's regained it, and that's what God does for us when he says, I chose you, and I brought you back to me. All of a sudden, there is new life, there's new joy. There's him looking sharp. <laughs> now, what's interesting about Fundo is he, is, you, is you have to understand where he came from. See, it's the, it's the abandonment of an orphan that you have been experiencing through the punishment of, and wage of sin, but the reality is when you see what you come through and what you are in Christ, his adopted child, all of a sudden there is a joy that comes with that. Now, Funo's not the perfect child, I can be honest with you. There are times when he pushes our buttons and he is a uh, mischievous five-year-old right now and pu- learning to push the limits. And sometimes we do the same thing to God, right? We're like, God, I want to do it my way. And we kind of push God back. I love what it talks about in Micah 6, 8. Because what does God really want from us as his children? Well, Micah 6, 8 is a great summary of that idea of what God truly wants from you and I. And that's really to be like him. Micah 6, 8 says, and you know it, it says this. says, he has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you or expect of you? Three things to act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Why those things? Because God is just. God is all about caring for those who have experienced injustice, and so often injustice and indifference go hand in hand, and so we need to act justly and stand up for those who need someone to protect them and to care for them, to be their voice, to do the work that our Heavenly Father has called us to do as his children. To love mercy because God is merciful. I'm so grateful for that. That God not only gives me more than I deserve, but he does not give me what I truly deserve. That in his mercy he says, I'm not gonna exact that punishment of you. And so he says, I want you to be like me. Act justly, love mercy. And ultimately, what does God want? He wants you. He says, walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly with your God, experiencing this relationship as an adopted son or daughter. What a privilege to know that that's how God looks at us. In fact, 1 Peter, I'm just jumping around on you guys all night tonight, sorry. 1 Peter chapter 2 kind of gives us our real identity spelled out, what it means. But Peter says this, but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This new identity that we have. What's our response? Praise, thankfulness, looking at what God has done for us you know, it's interesting, over spring break, my family and I went to New York City, and uh, one of our last days there, we went to the Museum of Natural History, which is this big, big building with a lot of old stuff. I was bored after about an hour. And we were looking at all this stuff, and there was ordinary stuff. It was like hats and glasses and weapons of small destruction that people had from a long time ago, and, and they were so ordinary, but the reason they're in this museum is because who they belong to. That's you. You might seem ordinary on the outside. You might seem broken and unable to stand the pressure of what's going on around you right now, but you have to understand who you belong to. All those pressures, 
I want to make you a slave again to fear. All of those things don't matter because you belong to your Heavenly Father. Back when I was your age, there was a movie trilogy that came out called Star Wars. I'm not sure if anybody likes Star Wars or not. All right, some of you do, good. But there's this middle, in the middle movie, which always the second movies are always weaker than the others, but in the middle movie, the climax is this great battle between Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, right? And they're battling out, you know, kind of the edges of this, this battle station, Death Star thing. And in the middle of this climactic battle, after they're kind of going at each other with their lightsabers, Darth Vader says these words that just rocked everybody. I mean, I'm talking, everybody around the world heard these words and went, ah! And the words were, Luke, I am your father. And we're all like, oh my! We never saw that coming. Well, I want you to remember, as you're getting ready to finish the semester, as you're getting into your finals, as you're feeling overwhelmed by assignments and expectations and pressures to perform, I want you just to hear that voice of, you are my son, you are my daughter, that you belong to the Almighty Father King, and that should change everything about us because when we understand who we belong to, then it doesn't matter what our grade is on some assignment that some professor dreamed up with in the middle of the night when he's thinking, what can I do to my students? (laughs) It doesn't matter what your parents really even think about your friends, what matters is who you belong to, and you belong to the Almighty God. Would you stand with me as I give you a final blessing? I want you to listen to these words of the Apostle Paul as he was praying over the church in Ephesus. When he prays for them in Ephesians chapter three, he says, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family and heaven on earth derives its name. Your name is now God's name. I pray that of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power to go with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is in work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.